So here we are in part two of the Gospel of Mark. Um, so this is the second gospel that we've um, jumped into. And um, a lot of similarity between the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew, as we'll find also with the Gospel of Luke, but very, very different than the Gospel of John. Um, the three Gospels, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all have very, very similar accounts in them. Um, but much like if uh, Rose and Jonah and Roberto and Michelle and I all witnessed the same account, and then years later we each um, put put pen to paper and wrote about that account, certain things would highlight to me that might not have highlighted as much to you and vice versa. And so uh, we would be capturing things that we knew were important, and then also things that were important to us because they, they held that meaning. And so that's why you'll find differences in those, those Gospels. Um, but yet the core um, events are the same. And maybe how the accounts are explained are a little different, but the events are the same. We know that as with the Gospel of Matthew, the focus was on the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of Mark is focused on um, not only the kingdom, but the authority of Jesus. And we've already seen a couple of those things in part one. And so we'll begin in chapter three uh, of the gospel of Mark. And so it's written, once again, Jesus entered the synagogue and a man with a withered hand was there. In order to accuse Jesus, they were watching to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. We know they are the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the ones who were challenging Jesus. Then Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, stand up among us. And he asked them, meaning those who were in the crowd who were ready to pounce on him and judge him, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or destroy it? But they were silent. And Jesus looked around at them with anger. And so, you know, it meant a lot to Jesus. And he was moved, um, emotionally moved, that he felt anger towards them because of their hardened hearts. And so his anger and sorrow at the hardness of their hearts was really showing and starting to reveal itself. Then he said to the man, the one with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was restored just like new. At this, the Pharisees went out and this is the hatred and the hardness of their hearts. They began plotting with the Herodians who were the Jews that followed King Herod, how they might kill Jesus. So Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, accompanied by a large crowd from Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Edomia, the uh, region beyond the Jordan, and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. The large crowd came to him when they heard what great things he was doing. Jesus asked his disciples to have a boat ready for him so that the crowd would not crush him. <laughs> so there were that many people there all around them. And so he asked for a boat. Uh, for he had healed so many that all who had diseases were pressing forward just to touch him. And when the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. But he warned them sternly not to make him known. Then Jesus went up on the mountain and he called for those he wanted. And they came to him. So he broke away from the crowd and he called just for the ones that he wanted to be with him. And then he appointed 12 of them. So we know there was more than 12 of them. He called a, uh, just the, the selected few with him, but he appointed of those 12 of them whom he designated as apostles to accompany him 
to be sent out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 that he appointed. Simon, who he had named Peter, James, son of Zebedee and his brother John, whom he named Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who carries that extra little tag, who betrayed Jesus. Then Jesus went home. And once again, a crowd gathered so that he and his di disciples could not even eat. The crowd was so great. When his family heard about this, they went out to take custody of him, saying, he is out of his mind. So people were listening to Jesus, and he was speaking not only with authority, but he was saying things that were disturbing to people. They just didn't even know how to take it. And they were starting to think, this guy's crazy. He's, he's actually a lunatic. And we know the Pharisees are already plotting to kill him. And the scribes who had come down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul. And by the prince of the demons, he drives out demons. So Jesus, well, he called them together and he began to speak to them in parables. And we know that Jesus loved to teach in parables. And here's a case where he's now on a roll. He's going to start teaching in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, it cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, it cannot stand. And if Satan is divided and rises up against himself, he cannot stand. His end has come. Indeed, no one can enter a strong man's house to steal his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. So you know we're not going to be able to take something from somebody who's guarding it or on the watch. Then he can plunder his house. Truly, I tell you, the sons of men will be forgiven all sins and blasphemies, as many as they utter. But because they said that he was not speaking from or not doing these acts and teaching from the spirit of God, but from Beelzebul, he says, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. And Jesus made this statement because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Then Jesus's mother and brothers came. Of course they did. They were hearing the message. Hey, guess what? Your son's a nut. Everybody wants to kill him. And he's rambling on in this room. And you need to come right now. You need to rescue him because the crowd's going to kill him. So his mother and brothers came and they stood outside. They sent somebody in to summon him. And a crowd was sitting around him. Look, he told them, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. But Jesus replied, who are my mother and my brothers? Looking at those seated in the circle around him, in spite of he, what he knew everybody's hearts were saying in the crowd that wanted to kill him, who were saying he was crazy, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus here really speaks to what he considers his truest family. That's not to mean that he would dishonor his, his mother and father. And we know that Jesus honored his mother uh, when he was on the cross before he died. And he looked to John and said, you'll take care of her. Here's your mother. And now he looked at his mother and he said, here's your son. But God has a spiritual relationship with a spiritual family. And Jesus is making it clear here. And in spite of the fact that his mother and brothers came to rescue him, he was letting it known, hey, I'm perfectly where I need to be. I'm with my mother and my brothers and my sister. 
So that concludes chapter four and takes us in to chapter, uh, excuse me, chapter three and takes us into chapter four. So once again, Jesus began to teach beside the sea. He loved to teach by the sea. In fact, the crowds could go and sit up on the shore and his voice would carry. So it was a great place for him to be able to connect with a larger crowd. And such a large crowd had gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat in it. Remember earlier he was saying, have a boat ready for me. Well, guess what? Now he's using that boat. And while all the people crowded along the shore, because they all wanted to get up close to him, they all wanted to touch him. They all wanted to be near Jesus. Some of them because they wanted to be healed. I'm sure some of them because of the Jerry Springer effect. Hey, I want to be able to go and brag to my friends that I was there, um, be able to boast. And so there was just a whole lot of people pushing up against him. He gets in a boat. And what does he do? He taught them many things in parables. And his teaching, in, in his teaching, he said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was sowing, some seed fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured it. Some fell on a rocky ground where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun rose, the seedlings were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the seedlings, and they yielded no crop. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it sprouted, grew up, produced a crop, one bearing thirtyfold, another sixtyfold, and another hundredfold. Then Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, he says this many times, and we're going to see it again and again in other places. But Jesus, when he used this line, he was saying, he who has ears, in other words, spiritual hear, ears, ears that are pointed towards God, ears that are pointed towards righteousness, let him hear. But he also mentions many times how, why he taught in parables, because hardened heart people don't have ears to hear. So as soon as Jesus was alone with the 12, and those around him. So there are others, but he's with his chosen disciples who he had appointed as apostles and plus his nearest uh, followers were all around him. They asked him about the parables. So this is Jesus's time for Koinonia. He's sitting with true believers, those who really are connected to him, have a personal relationship with him. And he's starting now to be asked, and they asked him about parables. And he replied, here's the deal. The mystery of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is expressed in parables so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Now, when people sometimes read this, they, they might feel as though Jesus is saying, I don't want all people to turn towards me and be forgiven. That's not at all what he's saying. What he's saying, that they don't have ears to hear, that they don't understand because their hearts are hardened. And he's not going to give them an easy road because there's a narrow road road, a narrow path that leads to the narrow gate, which is only him. So there's no easy road. There's only one way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so what Jesus is saying, so that they don't go find some other way to reach heaven, because it's not going to happen. They might turn and be forgiven. I'm not going to give that out. They are going to have to allow their hearts to be softened, turn to me, and believe in this good news, this gospel, and only then will they be forgiven. That's more of what Jesus is saying here. So then Jesus said to them, do you not understand this parable? Because they asked him about parables, 
he realizes that they didn't understand the parable. And then Jesus, in almost a chastising, says, then how will you understand any of the parables? So then he explains, the farmer sows the word. Some are like the seeds along the path. Talking about some people who hear the word, where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes, takes it away, and that which was sown in them is gone. Some are like the seeds sown on rocky ground. They hear the word and at once receive it with joy, but they themselves have no root in Christ, and they remain only for a season. And then, uh-oh, people are starting to give me a hard time. I'm uncomfortable in this environment because I'm more comfortable in the world. And when trouble and persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Others are like the seeds sown among the thorns and they hear the word and they grow up. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things other than the Lord come in and choke the word and what was once fruitful becomes unfruitful. So they took root, they had root, and now they, because of the way of this world, have turned their hearts away from God and have turned back to this world for other things. Still others, like the seeds sown on good soil, they hear the word, they receive it and produce a crop, 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold. Jesus also said to them, does anyone bring in a lamp to put it under a basket or under a bed? Because they all knew this was not a parable. This is common sense. When you bring a light in the room, you bring it in to brighten the room up. And so his point was, for there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be brought to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And so he's speaking now to his closest disciples. And he knows that through his disciples, they're growing and they're learning. So he went on to say, Jesus went on to say, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. And even more will be added to you. This is for all of us today. Pay attention to what you hear because with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So how deeply you go into Christ is, is the measure you'll get in return. And even more than that will be added to you. For whoever has will be given more, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Jesus also said, the kingdom of God is like a man who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, he sleeps and wakes and the seed sprouts and grows, though he knows not how. But all by itself, the earth produces a crop. First the stalk, then the head, then the grain that ripens within. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he swings the sickle because the harvest has come. Then he asked, to what can we compare the kingdom of God? With what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds sown upon the earth. But after it's planted, it grows to be the largest of all garden plants and puts forth great branches so that the birds of the air nest in its shade. With many such parables, Jesus spoke the word to them to the extent that they could understand. He's discipling his own through Koinonia. He's spending time with them, sharing parables, but yet explaining those parables to those who have an ear to hear. He did not tell them anything without using a parable, but privately he explained everything to his own disciples. Many people read the Bible, hear stories, 
watch shows, listen to podcasts, and they hear all this stuff. But if it's not the Holy Spirit and the Lord placing it within their hearts, and they're not doing it for the purpose of growing spiritually, then they won't have that clear understanding. But Jesus went on and taught about parables, but privately he explained everything to his, his own disciples, just as he does with us today. When that evening came, he said to his disciples, let us cross over to the other side. So after they had dismissed the crowd, which we know was a very big crowd, as it said, they took Jesus with them since he was already in the boat. And there were other boats with them. So there's several little boats out here and they're gonna cross over to the other side. Soon a very violent windstorm came up and the waves were breaking over the boat so that it was being swamped. Now, if you've ever seen a boat that's swamped, it fills with water and you really think you're gonna sink. You really think the boat's just gonna sink to the bottom. And this, their boat was completely swamped. But Jesus was in the stern sleeping on the cushion in the swamp boat and they woke him up they were petrified they were filled with terror and so they said to him teacher don't you care that we are perishing now that's like your child asking you when you're holding their feet in the water don't you care that i'm going to drown you're right there holding them. You've got full control, but they don't know that. And they were terrified. They hadn't experienced something like this. And Jesus was right there with them, but they were experiencing the fear of potential death. And Jesus knew this. So he got up and he rebuked the wind and the sea. Well, we know that the wind and the sea are part of creation. And we know everything was created through Jesus and nothing was created outside of Jesus. So the very wind and the sea are his creations. And here he shows miraculously what is elementary to him, but yet not to mankind, how he could just easily control his own creation. And he says, silence, be still. And the wind died down and it was perfectly calm. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Overwhelmed with fear, they asked one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They still, even though Jesus once again showed his authority over all, didn't recognize or didn't understand who he really was and what he was truly capable of, not just then, but forevermore, as he's capable of that today. So that concludes uh, part two, the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapters three and chapters four. And so now I'm going to uh, um, ask what is on your hearts.